It is my pleasure to introduce David Scheinberg, Professor of Neuroscience. David, please take it away. Thank you. Um, well, I will uh, start with a little bit of background here. I have to admit, when, uh, when Jason passed me along the name, I wasn't sure exactly what the vote had indicated people wanted to hear about, so uh, we'll see. And um, if, I get, if, we, if I go far, too far astray, please uh, bring me in, no, no problem. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, this question of animal behavioral monitoring, which is a very general topic, obviously. And um, uh, just some of the ideas that we could chat about, and I'll go through some of these, and we can speed through others, or if they become, if they're things that we want to dwell on and talk more about, or come back to, just stop me anytime, and feel free. I uh, mentioned earlier, I actually don't see the gallery, so if you just want to speak up, I have no problem with that. But I'll give you a teeny bit of history. I will emphasize the importance of timing, and then I'm going to just present a few things that actually I'm sure you know, but maybe worth thinking about, which are kind of considerations about what is your problem that you're working on and what are the things, if you're trying to run an experiment where you're collecting data from animals, and these animals could be people, I will say, which is what we do too, but uh, so in any case, uh, you know, how you, you know, what these questions include things like when do you need the data, uh, how are you supposed to control the experiment, uh, what are the actual tools you might use to gather the data? And then, of course, looking at it. And then I'll tell you at the end just briefly about a project that might have been on Jason's mind when he asked me, which is something we're working on right now. So uh, although I'll talk about almost the simplest things to start with, we have a project that is a relatively complicated sort of amalgamation of a few, few things that we've already heard a little bit about uh, in the past uh, that we're working on uh, right now. So in any case, a bit of history. When I started uh, doing animal behavioral monitoring is when I first joined Nico Slothetis' lab, uh, this is with, with non-human animals, uh, down in, in Texas. And when I got there, he had inherited systems from Peter Schiller that were based on the DEC PDP-11, uh, which uh, I'm now assuming that almost everybody is too young to know anything about. Um, but you can still find them on eBay. They still sell for the price. It's like the standard price for a computer always. Uh, it's like $2,000. Like, Okay, that's what a computer costs. That's still what this computer costs, even though it's from 1975. But in any case, it was a workhorse in laboratories at the time, and it's a little bit of a bygone error because computers were designed, this computer from a company that no longer exists, digital equipment, was designed for running, for really running experiments, doing research. And um, that's not something you find too much of these days. But it was doing for, re for real research. I mean, that is not just sort of tinkering around, but for actually running um, research experiments to gather data. Uh, and we used those until they died, but you couldn't buy any parts even back then. So uh, we moved over to a system that we currently have, which is based on, X, you know, regular Intel-based chip-type designs, x86. And we have these, and they share some of the same designs as the DEC computers did, which is that they include specialized pieces of hardware that help us in monitoring what's going on out in the world, because that's the problem that you're trying to deal with, is keeping track of things that are going on and making sure that they get coordinated properly so that you know exactly what happened. Uh, now that sort of standard has, uh, it's possible that we're about to see a new change because uh, it is true the technology changes and um, this SOC and then in the final part, sorry my pointer doesn't work here, but in the final picture you can see this uh, chip from TI, that's a system on a chip and it's a tiny box, it's about, uh, the, the, the computer is this big so it fits in your hand. Uh, these are probably adequate right now for actually doing much of what you need to do when it comes to behavioral monitoring. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that timing is super critical and uh, it's important both for control and acquisition and it's, uh, it's kind of, it can get away from you to some extent. Uh, but one point is that you, the experimenter, have to decide, all right, how, what is the time resolution that's important to me for the experiment I'm running? And um, for behavior, if you're doing behavioral monitoring, this number usually is on the order of milliseconds, which is... Uh, you know, by an engineer standard, incredibly slow. By a neuron standard, well, that's about what, sort of how a neuron operates. Uh, by sort of uh, general responsiveness of computers on your laptop and desktop, that's actually a little bit fast to be sure that things are happening in the order of milliseconds. So it kind of falls in this middle ground, I should say. Uh, but let's take an experiment that is like an experiment you might consider doing. This is actually with people, but it was uh, from uh, it's over 50 years ago, it's a fairly famous paper by Mike Posner and, and Mitchell, where they were asking people to do a very simple task. They presented two letters in a row and asked them, are they the same or are they different letter? And the letters could appear in the same case, uppercase, or they could be like a cross case, or they could be different letters. And 
one of the small findings that's actually carried forward and, and, and led to many others, but this was all about chronometry, that is sort of measuring the timing of, of cognitive pro of, of processing in the brain, really. And in this case, that one, of the one of the findings they had in that paper was that if the same physical letter is shown twice, you're 70 milliseconds faster than if the letter is switched from A to little a, which gives you some indication about, okay, that's sort of the range in which I better be prepared if I'm gonna build a system to make sure I can detect differences of 70 milliseconds. And um, you can imagine that uh, if it's a noisy system, you may still get the answer, but you're gonna need a ton of data because uh, the system is not very precise and you'll only maybe if it's as long as it's accurate finally get to the answer so you'd like your system not to be the problem you'd like it to be able to address the questions you're interested in so when it comes to timing i say who can you trust and this is actually surprisingly difficult to be sure that you have a reference for um knowing who you can trust because timing isn't uh, uh always something that you you know wh where's the real time so in the historically an oscilloscope is your best bet. I should say though that in most labs these days where the scope was commonplace in, in the past, they're not that common these in, in behavioral uh, labs. They're certainly common in physiology labs where you may be using the scope, but even there, they're kind of falling out of favor. I will point out for those of you who are interested, that technology here has helped out a lot too because there are some portable, cheap, relatively cheap, like on the order of a couple hundred bucks, scopes that are quite good and um, can give you resolution well beyond that, which you would care about from a behavioral perspective. So there's, this is one of them, I actually have this here. It's called, uh, well, I won't lift it up, but it's called this analog discovery. Anyway, it's possible to run these on your, on your computer uh, and, and, and get good access to timing. So here's a simple experiment, for example. What if I put a signal into a computer and ask the computer to give me the signal back out again? Uh, and I can do this on this little cheap little computer. So I can send a signal in like eight hertz and, and have the computer put it back out again. And uh, in this case, on this little box that I showed you, it turns out that the computer is really, really good at that if you set it up properly. This is a $65 computer and it can have a delay of about 10 microseconds uh, on average for the time it takes to get a signal in to put a signal back out again, which means that we are well within what we might care about in terms of sort of behavioral monitoring. Uh, you can't see it on bottom, but there's a little bit of jitter. And this raises a point, which is, I didn't tell you this, but I actually logged into that computer while I was running this experiment. And that's an important consideration uh, because this computer was designed to make sure that even if I logged in and played around, that it did what I asked it to do as best it could. And so, that timing, as I say, is critical, but usually you wanna do something with it. That experiment's kind of boring. All it does is get a signal in and put a signal out. What we care about when we're running experiments is we wanna bring data in, we wanna distribute it maybe to other places, we wanna see the data, we wanna use the data, we wanna store the data, and this is where it is a consideration. And if you have a system, you wanna think about how it works because when you add these steps, not just take a signal in and put a signal out, then you start to worry about, well, maybe my timing is getting off a bit. So I will say that most computer hardware is up to the task. The problem isn't the hardware, it's the software. Most software that we use every day, myself included, uh, is not designed for doing this actually. Whereas 50 years ago, the DEC PDP-11 was designed for doing this. The problem isn't speed, because speed has gotten to be, you know, about, uh, you know, better, way better than it was back then. The problem has to do with making sure that things you care about happen when they're supposed to happen. This is called prioritization and scheduling. And there are designed systems for handling this. These are called RTOS, real-time systems. And as I mentioned, the PDP did have that, and we've been using one over the past uh, 25 years. Uh, it's nice. It's not absolutely required, but it actually does help because it makes handling this problem a lot easier. Um, now, you might say, you're nuts. I've got an expensive system. I'm going to let it take care of all of that. I would tend to agree with you because there is an effort that goes into this, and there are dedicated systems that a lot of us have that are designed for doing this. Uh, but I will point out that you are still responsible for your data, and um, so it can be disconcerting when you spend tens of thousands of dollars on a system and you get a letter like this that says, oh, we recently learned about a bug in Windows 10 that results in an eight second packet loss that can affect all Cerebus and Neuroport systems. If you use other devices in your lab that interfere, interface with your Windows 10 computer through Ethernet UDP, this could affect you. This is not BlackRock specific. So uh, I'm not actually trying to point fingers here because it is a problem when you use commercial systems to sort of drive your own and their box is quite good. But 
the point of here is simply you are responsible for your data and it would be disconcerting if you sort of were so out of touch that you had to go back and look at your experiment only to realize that your null result was a result of losing eight seconds and missynchronizing the rest of the data file you know every day for three months or something that's that's not great and it means that it is worth thinking a little bit about hey do i really you know what's going on back there I will also point out that there are commercial systems for this, and in fact, as part of our COBRI, which uh, Jerome, is, Jerome Sainz is COBRI, which I'm a leader of a, the in, a core of that, um, we have a box that is available for folks to use if they'd like, which is specific. If you go to this website, Black Box Toolkit, you'll see they have tried to address this question to help you um, use a machine to actually test your machine. Uh, and um, so it's something that, that we can talk about and worth looking into. So a couple other things to think about, which we can discuss. One of them is, when do you need the data? Because this changes the way you do the experiment. Um, you should probably heard the words open loop or closed loop. I'm using them a little bit loosely here, but to say that in an open loop case, you actually just need to store things and you care that they're all stored exactly right, but you don't need access to them until later. Um, so for example, this happens all the time in engineering. They'll, they'll gather the data and then they'll go and look at it after the fact. So if you're gathering lots of data, like high-speed data, like Wi-Fi data, then it's coming in at 2.4 gigahertz. That's really fast, and you need a system who can reliably grab it, but you're not going to do anything with it until five seconds later, five minutes later, whatever it is. You don't really need it in the time it's being gathered. So it's still collected open loop, and that can be very reliable, but it's not always what we want for behavior because in a... In a behavioral context, some form of closed loop is very useful, especially if you can guarantee that you're going to get the data in a fixed time, because that means that you can do things with the data, and a lot of our experiments these days are of this ilk, and I know Jason has, has worked on this for, for a long time, and that is you get the data so that you can use it to do something else like pulse of light for optogenetic stimulation when a fly enters a chamber within in milliseconds, which I put in print in italics because remember that closed loop is only good if you can guarantee that it's going to happen at some rate. If you can't guarantee it's going to happen, you can still do it, but it's then it's only good if you can be sure that you can tell exactly when it did happen and throw out the garbage. That's a little bit less good, but it's still better than nothing. So having access to that is, is important, uh, and the better your control is, the better. Uh, I'll also point out that near real-time systems are really good too, because for behavioral experiments, which we're talking about, they give you access to what's going on. And for those of us who train animals where what is going on might be going a little bit astray, like you realize that in, uh, for monkeys, this happens all the time. They're kind of in a, in a bad place. They're making mistakes. They don't get what's going on. You realize, oh, maybe there's a bug. Maybe my experiment's actually not doing what I thought. That's the kind of thing that can be make or break for sending an animal into a, you know, oh, he'll never get this or she'll never get this to, oh, there's actually a problem and I'm mistraining the animal. And you can only do that effectively if you actually have near real-time access to what's going on. So it's worth trying to get that if you can. Um, all right, so I don't want to spend too much time on these topics, but I'll introduce them. So who actually run, what actually runs the experiment? This is a little bit tricky. Um, some system needs to run it. Every behavioral task requires some control. There are kind of two ways to go about this. You can either have what's called a frame loop where you just run in a big loop and you are asking, well, what time is it? What should I do now? What time is it? What should I do now? Uh, this, there are very, very reliable systems that run this way, but um, they're not perfect and they have some problem if you're not careful, which is if you're frame, if you don't know, like if you're in some tight loop and you don't know how long each operation takes, it actually can be a problem, especially if in each frame you actually ask to do something that takes longer than you expect. So if you want to have resolution of one millisecond, so you run these operations every millisecond, that's great. But what if the thing you asked to do during that millisecond actually takes six milliseconds? Now everything's off. So it's not as trivial as, as it seems to be in a closed, closed loop like that. Uh, it can work. And there are systems that actually work very well for this. They're dedicated, and many of you, I'm sure, have seen Arduinos before. If you're only doing a very fixed thing and there's nothing else that can interfere with that, then the closed loop is fine because it's actually running and that's all that's happening. But in any real experiment where there's a lot of things happening, then it's not usually that simple. So Arduinos can be great for certain things, but they're not great necessarily for controlling everything. 
And an alternative is this so-called event-driven, where what you have is you have a system that responds to external events, and then they only operate when something important happens, like a timer goes off or a button is pressed. Uh, and so they're really good for that, and um, they can be a little bit challenging to design, uh, but these are what are called reactive systems, and they're usually best conceived of as a state system, where you move through like a flow chart. I'm currently in the wait state. I'm currently in the animal hold his position state. Now, as long as he goes here, I'm currently in the moving around the track state, whatever it is, and things like that. So, so those are state systems, then they're very useful. Uh, okay, so what about gathering the data? Well, some tools are a lot better than others for the job. One thing that's quite interesting is that with the emergence of the internet of things, there are sensors that are essentially all over the place, which is pretty impressive. A couple of sites, you can find dozens of these now. Like I just showed you a couple of them. Like here's one from this company called Micro E. They've got an ammonia probe, they've got clocks, they've got surface temperatures. And the cool thing about these is that these little probes are usually about 10 bucks or 15 bucks. And they have a very standard way of interfacing to bring those data in. So what used to be an expensive thousand dollar card maybe uh, is now much cheaper. Uh, and can be highly reliable if they're used the right way. I just put up a second one from another company, SparkFun. They have their own system for gathering sensor data. So, you know, in the Internet of Things, sensors are sort of king because they let you have access to whatever's going on out there in the world. And this has an implication for collecting behavioral data in your experiments because you can use some of these things uh, if you sort of integrate them properly. Um, when you gather the data, there is a, there is a, it's kind of overwhelming because there's lots of ways of getting the data into your system. They can come in by standards, what are called buses. And uh, originally this would mean that like in that old deck PDP, there was this VME bus, which was inside the computer. You take a big card, you drop it in the bus. Uh, that was inherited by computers that we're still using. And many of us, even a desktop still has, which is a slot. So if you've ever seen the big graphics card that people use for gaming machines, those go into a slot, that's a bus. Uh, those are high performance, they're really good. They turn out to be actually a bit overkill for behavioral monitoring for many things because they're super fast and they, you don't actually need the speed that they offer depending on the problem you have. Uh, many of you have heard of USB, of course, because that's how we plug our mice into our computers. This is a bus. It's not ideal for data acquisition because it's not, uh, the timing of it is a little bit uncertain. Uh, but there are many sensors, like the ones I just showed you, that meet other specs. We don't need the details here, but there's this I squared C bus, this SPI. These are very common in the world of small computers, and they uh, offer good opportunities for cheap but reliable ways of getting data into your system. Serial port is as old as they get, because this is before there were even monitors. You could use a serial port to communicate with your computer. They're actually quite reliable, but they're not very fast. Uh, but they can be used and used well judiciously. Uh, Ethernet, as you probably know, ubiquitous. It's okay for data acquisition. It's not the best, but it is actually really, really good for certain things like high throughput. So if you have video data, it can come across either the USB or uh, Thunderbolt you've probably heard of or, or even Ethernet now. So um, the signals you have, these can come in two basic forms, digital or analog. Think about the digital signals as being represented by just logic. Are they you know, up or down? Uh, the level of that logic is, is not really important. It can be five volts, it could be three volts, it could be 1.8 volts. Um, button presses, for example, fall in this camp. The good thing about these kind of events is they can be actually triggered just of when they change. So you don't have to keep track of them all the time, just know when they change. And that's actually a good way to operate for digital events, just know when they're changing. Because you can timestamp when they change with super high reliability, sort of like I demonstrated a moment ago. Now, you don't always have that luxury, though, because some signals change over time, and these would be things like where the eyes are looking at any one moment, or voltage, or current, and some kind of physiology experiment that you're correlating with your data. Those are things that have to be sampled, and they would get digitized and then stored with the computer, and the rate at which they sample is something that you decide uh, when they would make sense. Uh, spikes, for example, you'd like to sample maybe 30,000 times a second to really see the entire action potential. Um, all right, so I'm going to zoom through here and just point out there's many, there are many specialized devices that deliver specialized data streams, things like eye trackers or motion trackers, video feeds, you've got audio samplers, 
or event detectors. Like you've got a whole box whose whole job it is, is to figure out based on some other information, whether an animal's rearing, grooming, or sleeping. We know this because this is happening here at Brown. So you may set, sort of treat that machine or that box as a standalone box and only want to get the output to control your experiment or to be um, stored as part of your experiment. So you just sort of treat it as a machine that does that. And then you can figure out a way to get that into your system. So they will all have some format for getting data out. Otherwise, they don't really serve any purpose because they're you know, getting data in. They need to give it out to something. So you're, you would then want to figure out and think about, well, how am I supposed to, what's the best way to get that into my system? Um, when it comes to looking at the data, I would uh, encourage you to store as much as you can that makes sense because you don't have to store everything, but if you do, uh, you should err on the side of storing maybe more than you think because if you can't create what happened from your data, well, then you can't recreate what happened and that's a problem, especially for reproducibility because you're like sort of lost as to, well, I think it was working, but I'm not so sure and I have no other way of knowing that. So. Um, to, to the extent to which you can, as a group, as a lab, as a team, set up ways to store data in a, in a uh, uh, sort of a, a holistic way, I would definitely recommend that. Um, when you can't predict things ahead of time, it's, uh, it often is the case that you have to stream out things as they occur. So you often will stream events, and this will be seen in many different systems where they, because sort of, you don't know when the animal's gonna cross the threshold. You don't know when the fly is gonna go one way or the other. So you're just waiting for that to happen, but then you need to stream it when it does. Uh, and it can be useful to interpret these online to know what's going on, but that's not always required. Um, uh, you can include things like your planned conditions, which would help you analyze them right away. And this is useful if you can do that. Um, and it is worth keeping in mind that you're trying to separate out what your experiment is about from how you're actually running it. Those aren't the same thing. And this is sometimes confusing to people that, you know, well, I have a set of trials I want to run. I'm just going to put them into the middle of the thing that's running the experiment. It's useful to keep those a little bit separated because they're not identical. And it's useful to reuse the thing that runs the experiment with, say, a different set of conditions and things and know that the thing that runs the experiment is very reliable. You don't have to keep tweaking that, just change the conditions. So try to keep a separation there if you can. Uh, and if timing matters, then you really ought to have some signals in your data that you can help verify and maybe catch if eight seconds are missing from your data somehow. So, um, all right, so that's the background. I'm gonna tell you in two slides about a project we have going on and we can chat. Um, this is a project called, we call Closing the Loop on Markerless Tracking. A couple of weeks ago, we heard from Mackenzie Mathis, who was one of the Deep Lab Cut chief developers. She and, um, uh, and their group uh, have been developing this system for video acquisition of uh, markerless video acquisition that can be immediately turned into, or I shouldn't say immediately, can be then processed in a way to deliver uh, estimations of where things are objects or parts of objects like limbs and, and, and things and um, taking advantage of the current generation of convolutional neural networks that are uh, can be well adapted to this kind of problem so it's gained widespread adoption dlc deep lab cut uh, we've talked a little bit about it i know there are a lot of labs that have started using it or are interested in using it we too it's actually very good it does what they say it does which is it with very little training you can get quite reliable results back um, we've used it in this traditional way. You acquire video, you then use the video frames to train where things are that you care about, then you sort of freeze that after having trained it and you're satisfied, and then say day after day, you get new video in, you can process the video uh, and using that stored network and get back out where the, for every frame, where the points of interest are or maybe the fact that, that they couldn't be identified. So that all works actually quite well. The problem is, I don't know if this will work or not, but we'll try. So we've used this for, um, for tracking hands, for example. This is an experiment where the monkey's recognizing objects by touch. And so you see the video and you can see where we're tracking, if, if, I'm not sure you can or not, but you can see, that we, what, well, what we tried to do is to monitor or to track where his fingers are as he reaches out and touches one of two objects while he's recognizing them. And, um, at that point, we realized, well, you know, it really would be useful for a system like this to so-called close the loop, because if you could close the loop and not store the video frames and then analyze them after, maybe the same day or a week later or a month later, whenever you get around to it, if you can generate the outputs on the fly and you can verify they're reliable, then you can avoid saving the video, which is good. Um, not necessarily, it kind of goes against what I said a second ago, which is to save everything. And, um, but I will say that for those of us who use eye trackers, We've 
for years never saved the actual, even though we use video eye trackers, we don't save the video. Uh, that's the norm because we sort of trust the trackers. Um, you know, for better or for worse, that's the way it works. And so the advantage is, is that the data are available and much more compact than the video feed immediately. So that's all good. And that would be, uh, I think, something that would increase the utility and the actual use of these systems if you didn't have to set aside huge amounts of storage for the video, which can get quite large. Perhaps more interesting from an experimental perspective, though, is that if you can close the loop and you can get the data out of the system quickly, you can do things with the tracking data with really short latency and have it affect the experiment. You can change a stimulus while the eyes are making a saccade, for example, which you can do right now with current eye trackers. We have done experiments like this. It would be nice to, to prove that something like deep lab cut could actually be used for that purpose also. Uh, you can also do things like deliver stimulation. I mentioned this before in closed loop. When a movement occurs or an action occurs or some event occurs, you can actually use that as a trigger. So, so our approach would be to take the system on the left, which is the standard one, but to try to take a, the snapshot, which is shown at the end of the process path, uh, and then to use that and optimize it for what's called inference. The thing about Deep Lab Cut is it's really optimized for learning from your training of new data sets, learning new um, marker, and so, which is great because that's why it's flexible. But when it's working, there isn't a whole lot of training going on anymore if it works well. And so you can actually freeze it in a more optimal way. And there are a couple of groups who've started working on this, but we've, we, over the last uh, year or so, have started testing it ourselves to try to get optimized models for inference. And when you do that, then you can actually try to drive the system uh, and get feedback. And we've actually acquired cameras that can run quite quickly, for example, depending on how much, how big the image is. And on the top left, you can see that frame rates can go up to six, seven, eight hundred frames per second, uh, which is pretty good for video. Uh, and you can then say, well, can we use that to actually do something like a problem that we actually know how to, we have systems for doing, tracking the eyes. And so we've shown that, yeah, if you train Deep Lab Cut to track, uh, say, the four positions of the pupil, you can see Art here, and Brian, my postdoc, um, then you can actually compare how Deep Lab Cut does versus how this inference optimized system does. And what I'm showing on the right is a histogram of distances between those two outputs. So if we like the output from Deep Lab Cut, this Tensor RT, this optimized version, is off by no more than a couple of pixels in a pretty large image. So I feel we feel pretty confident that it's, uh, and that trade-off has to do with some of the optimization because it changes from being, say, floating point math to integer math, if you care. But in any case, it's still pretty good. Um, so our goal is to Ver, uh, verify that we can get this to work and then to uh, see if we couldn't apply it to other problems that I know a lot of uh, folks around here have things like um, uh, tracking animals as they move, tracking flies, uh, proboscis ex extension, maybe worms as they move, whatever it might be. So, all right, I am going to stop there. I want to thank a few folks, but I am happy to begin a conversation.